Okay, we're going to get started, everyone. So, so hi and um, welcome. My name is Mark Mizrucki, and I'm in my 10th year as director of the Organizational Studies Program. But I've actually been involved with the program since before it, it existed. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you to the celebration of our 20th anniversary as a formal program. And actually, you know, we operate as if we're a department, and at one point maybe we will become an official department. We are limited today in terms of time, but we are more than going to make up for it in terms of quality, because what a program we have for you. But before proceeding, I want to personally thank Chelsea Williams. Where are you, Chelsea? Raise your hand. There she is. Yes. Our, Chelsea is our events coordinator, and she organized, facilitated, and is producing this event. So thank you, Chelsea. She even told me when to start. She, everything I do is going to be at Chelsea's direction, whether you see this or not. So one of the things that has made OS the great program that it is, is that our number one focus has been on our students, both those currently here as well as our alums. And our students continue to do great things, both as students here and as alumni. And so as a reflection of that, we're going to first hear from one of our alumni. And then we're going to hear from a panel of people who were instrumental in putting this program together. And as you'll see, instrumental is an understatement. Then we'll hopefully have some time for the four of them to remark to one another, maybe some questions for the audience. And eventually, we will have a reception. So. Um, I do want to say, do one thing though before we get started, and that is I want to give a shout out to a group we don't hear much about, but who are crucially important to the formation of this program. We don't know exactly when it started, but sometime in the early 1980s, a handful of enterprising University of Michigan students put together an independent concentration program that I don't know whether they were the ones to name it, but eventually it became known as the Organizational Studies Program. And by the 1990s, hundreds of U of M students had participated in this major. And they and you, some of you may be listening, I hope you are, they are ultimately responsible for the existence of organizational studies today. I've started referring to them as the pioneers. And we owe them our gratitude. So if there are any of you out there, um, original OSers who took the major before we were a formal program, on behalf of everyone who followed, thank you. And now I want to introduce our keynote speaker, Sherry Chisholm, formal, formerly Sherry Davis. A native of Detroit, Sherry is currently the Executive Director of Leading on Opportunity, an organization devoted to improving educational and career opportunities for disadvantaged youths in the Charlotte, North Carolina metropolitan area. Prior to that, Sherry held leadership positions in several nonprofits, as well as in school districts across the country, where she focused on strategic planning, leadership development, and improving organizational effectiveness. She was the founding executive director of Urban Alliance Detroit, a nonprofit that provides paid internships, job skills training, and mentoring for disadvantaged youths in Detroit. She was head of strategy, talent, and operations for Teach for America in Atlanta. And she's held leadership positions in so many other organizations that it would take up all the time we've allocated to her for me to list them all. Sherry worked as a, prior to her public service work, um, Sherry worked as a consultant at Deloitte, where her clients included the Los Angeles School District, 
uh, Departments of Public Welfare and Education in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, as well as Coca-Cola and AT&T. Sherry attributes her lifelong interest in advocacy and education to her mother, who spent 35 years as a teacher and principal in the Detroit public schools. In addition to her OS degree, she graduated in 2007, Sherry also double majored in Spanish. She has a master's in education from Harvard and a second master's from the Broad Center for Management of School Systems in Los Angeles. Sherry and her husband now live in Charlotte and they welcomed their first child last year. So please join me in welcoming Sherry Chisholm. She will be on, on a Zoom call. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you all virtually. I regret not being able to be there in person, but I am certainly there in spirit celebrating. Uh, 20 years is a big deal, and I welcome the staff, students, and faculty who are here to celebrate this very auspicious time. Uh, 20 years is something that I think about often in my current career. Uh, 20 years is just about that of a generation, and a generation is considered the time from which a person is born to that time they go on to um, get their education, start their career, and then if they so choose, start the, the next uh, generation of individuals. And as Mark mentioned, here at Leading on Opportunity, uh, we are specifically interested in what it looks like to create better outcomes for those folks who were born in Charlotte such that they can um, achieve, celebrate, and be a part of the beautiful city that we occupy. I want to tell you a little bit about my journey over the past 20 plus years and how Leading um, opportunity has benefited from that work um, as a byproduct of my time as a student in OS. Uh, my journey starts with my grandparents. I am the granddaughter of the Great Migration, which means that my grandparents came to Detroit from rural Alabama in hopes of better outcomes for themselves and for their family and to escape the segregation of the South. Along with that means that there was a lot of hope built into what outcomes would look like for me. Um, I am first generation college student um, on one side of my family. On the other side, my mother, is, my mother and I are still the only ones who graduated from college. And so when they thought about what success looked like for me, it was a no brainer that I would go on to get a degree. I was a hardworking um, student. I um, had really great grades. I was student body president. I played a sport. I did all the things that they tell you on the college website are important to get in to an undergraduate institution of your choosing. Um, however, I was waitlisted to the University of Michigan and it took me a really long time to be open with that part of my journey, but it is very much so a real part of it. Uh, the truth is I was woefully academically unprepared to compete with the leaders and the best that Michigan attracts. Um, but as I told you before, I come from a generation and a generation before that of really hard workers. Despite not being academically prepared, I knew what it meant to work hard. I knew what it meant to build relationships to get work done. And I knew how to make the best of less than ideal circumstances such that I could achieve what I wanted to. Um, without having the language for it, um, I entered the university academically unprepared, but as an organizational psychologist who loved people and culture and knew how to get stuff done. And I am thankful to Michigan for giving me that opportunity. Uh, in my freshman year, as I was trying to figure out what would be next for me, knowing that I had this passion for culture at the time Spanish, um, in particular, what my next step would look like. And for me, that seemed like nonprofit and where I could contribute in the way that made sense for me. And so luckily my um, next door roommate, my freshman year, her name is Carrie. She has since gone on to become an architect in Chicago, but she went to an organizational studies info session. And back in the day, um, things were still printed on paper. And so she brought me back a half sheet of paper that had some highlights about what OS was about. And she recommended that I participate. 
after going to an info session, I knew very on that it was exactly what I wanted to do next. Um, I had the GPA I needed to get into OS, which you all know is very high. However, as a first generation college student, I hadn't been taught how to navigate um, thinking about what career would look like. I just knew what it meant to be in college, that it was important to be in college. So when I saw that the requirements were that I needed to have all the, you know, the prereqs, prereqs done, I was missing econ. And so decided to take econ at a community college that summer such that I could have the requirements that I needed completed so that I could be a part of organizational studies. It meant just that much to me to find an environment where I would be supported. Um, and I'm very thankful that I did that. From the very beginnings of my uh, year, two years in organizational studies, um, the program faculty and staff wrapped their arms around me. They gave me the language to describe what I intuitively knew I was called to do, but didn't have the skills um, or the words to describe. In particular, I want to thank Melissa Eljamal, who from the very beginning, from whatever reason I have yet to identify, saw something in me and nurtured me and made time for us to talk about academics as well as what my personal journey looked like and has continued to nurture me along the way creating a space for me to be creative about what my professional and personal journey would look like. I also want to thank uh, Victoria Johnson, who was one of my first professors, who was just the personification of brilliant cool. Um, I told y'all I'm a little older, so I've been out of OS for a while, but I distinctly remember uh, Victoria saying one day that it was a beautiful day outside and while we were learning about very difficult and complex topics that we needed to be in the sun to be with one another and to really enjoy learning in an environment that felt good. And as someone who came from a public school education in Detroit, that was not something I'd ever experienced before and it gave me a freedom I was able to carry with me and still take into my leadership journey. And uh, Victoria, I remember as brilliant as she was as a professor and an author, and she lives in New York, uh, she could also hold her own with any Beyonce gossip. Uh, Beyonce was just going solo at the time, and I just thought it was really cool that she could blend those two things into her authentic self and share it with her students in a beautiful way. Uh, essentially, organizational studies was a utopia for me. It gave me an opportunity to gain skills, to explore ideas, to coalesce around something that I felt but couldn't quite explain, that has continued to give me opportunity after opportunity after opportunity and served as the foundation of my success. I am immensely grateful. At the end of uh, organizational studies, as all students are thinking about what the next step is, I was preparing for a career. And like I said, I came into OS knowing that I would be, that I would go into nonprofit. I come from a family that had done well, as I talked about before, but we were really in what they call those gateway out of poverty jobs. So, you know, my mom had been a teacher, my, um, both of my father had worked on the line at Ford, my stepfather owned his own small business. You know, professional um, or executive roles wasn't something that was familiar to me. So I was having a conversation with my good friend, Mary Claire Olszewski, who I know is on the call today. And uh, she said something to the effect of, Sherry, you are really passionate about these cool things that impact the world and nonprofit, and you're really smart. Why don't you come make some money with me in corporate consulting? And that's how I found out about corporate consulting and went to Deloitte. And I say that because it's in the relationships, it's in the cultivation of trust, it's in them that what leads to the learning and understanding that creates opportunities for students and why I continue to be engaged. And so with that encouragement from Mary Claire, we case study together. And I distinctly remember Mary Claire and I driving my car that I bought for a whopping $1,000 <laughs> up 94 East to our final interview with Deloitte. And let me tell you, my car was raggedy. So the, the door that's on the gas tank, it just flapped up and back and forth in the wind. But I cherish those early years with Mary Claire when we were figuring out the very beginning stages of our journey together. From there, as Mark shared, um, I was at Deloitte for about four years, went on to get my master's from Harvard, of which I was not waitlisted for. 
Um, and I owe it a lot to the skills and academic um, ability I developed while at Michigan and OS. Went on to get my master's in education and spent the bulk of my career um, continuing to work in organizations. For me, my sweet spot is specifically in communities where governments and businesses come together in corporate and community partnerships. And it has been my goal to continue to provide those opportunities for other OS students. Um, yes, I have, I'm a mentor when I can be. I've provided opportunities for internship, and I will always welcome the opportunity to come back and speak to diverse students who are specifically interested in OS, but don't see it as an option for them. I want them to know that they are worthy and that the program will wrap their arms around you and help you achieve what you hope um, for your future. And so where I am now at the ripe old age of 37, I am a mother, which means I am preparing the next generation after me um, to succeed at their highest potential. My husband and I recently relocated to Charlotte, North Carolina, where we will continue this work together in our profession, as well as for our daughter, thinking about what is possible and dreaming about possibility for her. So to the OS staff and faculty, I am incredibly thankful for the foundation that you all have provided with me that I continue to build upon and refer back to in moments when I need a little strength. To the OS students who, if you're just entering your journey or thinking about your next step after college, I encourage you to lean into and embrace the possibilities of OS. Uh, the relationships are there in addition to the academics and the resources to nurture the very best you, you can be. So as you think about your next 20 years, what will you do with it? What will you do with the opportunity that you've been given through this very unique program to benefit the world around you? I thank you all so very much and look forward to spending a little bit more time together. Wow, <laughs> that was phenomenal. It's going to be a hard act to follow. We will do our best, I promise you. Thank you, Sherry. So now we're going to turn to the second part of our program. When I think about the people who were most responsible for making org studies what it is today, four names come immediately to mind. And I'm thrilled to be able to say that all four of these people are here today. Rick Price. Dave Barger, Victoria Johnson, and Jason Owen Smith. I could take the next hour and a half and I wouldn't come close to being able to tell you everything that they have done for the program, which is why we're going to let them speak for themselves. But since all of them are probably going to be far more modest than they should be, I'm going to do the bragging and I'm going to introduce each of the four. So how we're going to do this is I'm going to read um, brief bios of each of the four and then they will come up and um, the bios will not be in the order of the speakers but I'll get that all sorted out for you. So Jason Owen Smith is professor of sociology and co-founder and executive director of the Institute for Research on Innovation at the Institute for Social Research. He studies how complex networks among people and organizations shape knowledge work and innovation, especially within research universities. Jason has published in every major sociological journal, as well as in Science, Cell, and the Journal of the American Medical Association Surgery Journal. He's also the author of the widely acclaimed book, Research Universities and the Public Good. In 2006, he received a National Science Foundation Career Award and an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Industry Studies Fellowship in Biotechnology. He's received the U of M's Henry Russell Award, which recognizes mid-career faculty for exceptional scholarship and conspicuous teaching ability. He's received an LSA Excellence in Teaching Award and the John Dewey Award, another teaching honor, also from LSA. Jason was the first faculty member hired in the organizational studies program. 
He served as director of the program from 2010 to 2012, and he also served as director of the Barger Leadership Institute from 2011 to 2018. Victoria Johnson is professor of urban policy and planning at the City University of New York, where she teaches on philanthropy and nonprofits. Victoria began at the U of M in 2002 as a postdoctoral fellow at what is now called the Ross School of Business. She joined OS as an assistant professor in 2005. She was promoted to associate professor in 2012, and she was on our faculty until 2015. Victoria's first book was on why the Paris Opera survived the French Revolution. Her second book, American Eden, which she began with support from OS and the BLI, was named a New York Times Notable Book of 2018. It was a finalist for the 2018 National Book Award in nonfiction and was one of two finalists for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize in History. Victoria is currently working on a biography of the 19th century American painter and environmentalist Frederick Edwin Church, supported by a Guggenheim Fellowship. Victoria's love for OS is reflected in the fact that she made the trip from New York just to be on this panel. Dave Barger is someone who requires no introduction to the org studies community. A co-founder of JetBlue Airways, Dave served as president, chief operating officer, and eventually CEO of the airline from its founding in 1998 to 2015. Dave once, I don't know if you remember this, but I once attended a luncheon at which Dave remarked that he had seriously considered naming it Go Blue Airways. <laughs> Dave was one of the original members of the Org Studies Leadership Committee. He was instrumental in creating the Bar Barger Family Professorship, which I've been honored to hold, which supports the OS directorship as well as a scholarship program to support student participation in summer programs at the London School of Economics. Since 1987, Dave has contributed more than $18 million to the University of Michigan, not only for OS, but also to LSA, University Libraries, Michigan Medicine, the Alumni Association, and the Athletic Department. He also provided the gift that launched the Barger Leadership Institute and endowed the Barger Leadership Institute professorship held by the director of the BLI. His contributions have provided student athletes with opportunities for academic, career, and leadership development, and they've also helped with renovations to Michigan Stadium. Dave has also been involved in several other committees at the U of M, including the LSA Dean's Advisory Council. I want to add on a personal note that he's been a constant source of advice and wisdom for me during my entire term as director of OS. Dave now serves as an operating partner at Connor Capital based in Santa Barbara and as co-chair of the industry specialists at the Oak Tree Transportation Infrastructure Fund. Last but far from least, Richard H. Price. Rick is the Stanley E. Seashore Collegiate Professor of Psychology and Organizational Studies Emeritus and a research professor at ISR. Rick's research, which has been supported by the National Institutes of Health, the Carnegie Corporation, and multiple other foundations, has focused on improving worker health and productivity largely through surveys and experiments. His numerous awards include the American Psychological Foundation Gold Medal Award for Lifetime Achievement, um, the Distinguished Contribution Award from the Society for Research and Action, the Group Psychologist of the Year Award from the American Psychological Association, and the Lyle, Lila Rowland Award for Prevention Research from the National Mental Health Association. Most important for us, Rick is the founder of the Organizational Studies Program and served as its first director from 2001 through 2010. He was also the founding director of the Barger Leadership Institute, the BLI, 
I can honestly say that without Rick, there would be no org studies. I cannot imagine a more star-studded panel than this one, and I can only apologize for taking so much time to introduce them. The way we're going to work this, I've told each participant, you get 10 minutes. I don't know how strict I'm going to be, but I'm, <laughs> you know, we do have a time limit, so I'm going to try to keep them to 10 minutes. <clears throat> then if time permits, if any of them have, have to criticize any of the others for any uh, untoward remarks that <laughs> they may have made toward one another, uh, they will have an opportunity for responses and rejoinders. Then, hopefully, we'll have enough time to open the room up for some questions. And um, after that, we will have a reception. So the order of speaking, um, Rick is going to lead us off, followed by Victoria, Jason, and then Dave. So you, you guys could all come up here. Um, you can stay there however you want to do it. Is this where you want us? Yeah. Take the, if you want to get up here, you, you may, but, or you can just sit and talk. So, Rick, you're first. It's good to see so many old friends here. I'm, I really feel as if I'm at home now. And uh, it, I'm very touched to see all of you, and I hope we'll have a chance to talk afterward. Um, in order to control my own verbosity, uh, I've actually written a couple of things so that Mark doesn't have to reach over and poke me. Uh, Mark alluded to the thing I wanted to share with you all, uh, and it had to do with how in the world all of this got started. Can you hear me, by the way? OK. Um, so, so the topic that I want to offer is uh, how an underground student movement became organizational studies. I'm going to tell a, a bit of the, the behind the scenes work that actually led to the beginning of this program. Um, organizational scholars will tell you that 20 years can be a very long time in the life of, of an organization or very short, depending on your point of view. This is perhaps especially true for the beginning years of an organization, when so much adaptation is both needed and inevitable. And we've been seeing that go on here. The passing of two de decades will have produced many different stories of the origins of organizational studies. I suspect each of you has your own. Nevertheless, I'd like to offer my own story of how uh, org studies began and uh, how it's now carrying on a successful life. Here's the story. Here's the skinny. More than 20 years ago, a small band of enterprising undergraduates from Michigan discovered a way to start an underground major about organization. This creative crew found a loophole in the college rules called the Individual Concentration Program. Basically, nobody knew about it. The loophole created the possibility of individualized majors outside of any single department's requirements at all. Simply put, a Michigan undergraduate, if they were clever enough, could invent her own major, smorgasbord style, drawing on courses from all around the university. Without telling the administration, these curricular desperados recruited individual faculty sponsors to sign off on these majors. But why stop there? They even recruited a sympathetic undergraduate advisor to help them carry out their underground work. Some of the majors our enterprising crew invented were uh, by conventional standards, exotic indeed. The majors included courses in rare languages, group art projects, as well as highly specialized seminars in technical topics. But before long, the word got out. At first, there was only a trickle of these undergraduate majors. But once the word got out, 
the secret underground major about organizations had become, became one of the most popular majors in the College of LSNA. Sort of every, all the administrators knew about it. They were wringing their hands. What is going on? They had no idea. The, the, stu the alarm bells began to ring uh, in the administration. And when the word got out to th about this illegitimate operation, <laughs> the dean was immediately threatened to shut it down. And there was real panic among this underground group. The students fought back, though. Being clever about the power of public exposure, they placed an article in the Daily Student newspaper blowing the whistle on the dean for discouraging what they called student enterprise and creativity. <laughs> Our kind of people. <laughs> <laughs> then under pressure and needing faculty help, the leader of these enterprising rebels, who I'll call Jay, I hope he'll come back one day, he's quite an amazing person, knocked on my office door. I was, seemed to be getting a stream of people who were in trouble for one reason or another <laughs> at that stage of the game. I had an initial conversation with the dean, who was indeed outraged. Uh, I, I should say parenthetically that that particular dean, who occupied the role for only a few years, has long since left Michigan to go on to other greater things. And so any, any uh, possible libel suits are probably not, not going to be a problem. Uh, I had a conversation. I gathered, once I'd had this conversation with the dean and sort of let the smoke clear a little bit, I gathered some faculty colleagues, including, including a number of people who are present here, uh, and we created a kind of panel. The idea was to create a group of leading academic scholars, large, broadly in organizations, to convince the dean that this underground major could be an exciting interdisciplinary learning experience. Seeing the possibility of a legitimate major, the dean finally relented. She, she authorized the major, and to my surprise, over time, provided office space, authorization to hire staff members, and eventually to hire faculty members as well. So all of a sudden, things turned. All of a sudden, the dean, actually, and I have to say this parenthetically and privately, the dean uh, took a few of us into her office and in a, in a very sort of um, manage, magisterial way, took out one piece of paper, placed it on her desk, read a declaration that this program would now exist, picked up the paper, put it in her folder, got up and walked out of the room. That was it. We looked at each other. Okay. <laughs> uh, there followed after this moment a frantic summer of work by a small group of students and staff and faculty members creating all the, all the hardware and the software that we know we need to actually invent one of these things. We created course descriptions out of whole cloth. We created flyers. We wrote program statements. And these were students, graduate students, faculty, just sitting actually in my lab most of the time, trying to figure out how we were going to put this thing together. We wrote position descriptions, administrative roadmaps of different kinds. And organizational studies opens its door that fall and offered admission to no more than 50 students a requirement of the dean. Once students heard that enrollment was limited, this is an interesting point. Once students learned that the enrollment was limited, they concluded it was a competitive and highly sought after major. It was hot stuff. They made the new major even more desirable to undergraduates, and the applications began to roll in. 
The whole enterprise would have failed without the heroic efforts of the amazing staff members faculty and faculty of organizational studies. They understood the energy and excitement of the, study of the students and used their considerable talents to turn the promise of a program on paper into a powerful learning enterprise. That's the story. But I should say, it does indeed take a village to create any new thing. This has certainly been true for organizational studies. I want to mention just some of the people who were involved in the early years of the program because they started orga the st organizational studies tradition of caring and of excellence. They believed in the students, cared deeply about them, and did whatever it took to make the students and the program a success. This is truly a bottom-up bottom enterprise. And it was all about caring and believing in the students. It came from all parts of this gang that we had. And then later, as they came, that ethos, that belief in the students and their excellence and their possibilities was what it was all about. Uh, in the beginning, our staff did it all. Um, that ragtag group of people in my lab said, were told, were told by Ellis and me that they had an idea of, of someone who would be a really good key administrator. And so we had lunch with this person over in the union, and everybody looked at each other and said, let's, let's go, let's hope we can get her right now. That woman was Suzanne Jones, and in the beginning, she was the heart of the program, and I hope at some point uh, you will all get a chance to meet her. But in addition, shortly thereafter, Kathy Philbin, who's here, Denise Yakoulis, who's here, and Melissa Altamol uh, were part of the crew, and others followed, like Tiffany Purnell, for example. But leadership comes in many forms, and from colleagues and friends, including our colleagues here on the panel, who are such an important part of my life, and always will be. Uh, Victoria Johnson, Mark Mizrucki, Jason Owen Smith and Dave Barger. Colleagues across the university jumped in also. They did it often without being paid. They jumped in to teach courses when we didn't have anybody. They, they volunteered to work with students when we didn't have any way to compensate them. They include, and this is just a few of the people, and, and there were many, many more. Wayne Baker, Jane Dutton, Jerry Davis, Gretchen Spritzer, Adam Grant, and Elizabeth Armstrong. Adam is an interesting story. He was just finishing up, he was just about to finish up his dissertation, go on the job market. And I said, I don't have anybody to teach our core course. And Adam said, oh, I'll do it. <laughs> and he did. Did it brilliantly. Managed to go off and do the rest is really history. Um, Elizabeth Armstrong as well, another colleague from sociology. Wonderful, wonderful colleague. There are too many more to name them all. Many of them and others will be there for organizational studies during the next 25 years as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Victoria? I'm ready for this to show up on the screen. Do I do that myself? Let's see. Here we go. There we go. <laughs> okay. Let's check my. Okay. So, uh, Mark, uh, thank you for the invitation. 
to come back and help celebrate this incredible milestone for OS. Um, it's been uh, seven years since I left, since I left this beautiful city to go back to New York to be near to family and uh, to the um, to the cultural and scientific institutions where I tend to do most of my research. Um, even though it's been seven years, I still find daily life influenced by the OS culture, the program, its people, things I learned here. Uh, and one of those things was, one of the earliest things I learned was the importance of a very particular question. And that question, uh, I learned from Rick Price. Um, I'm, I was a philosophy major as an undergrad, and I was, then I became a sociologist. And I'm used to people asking the question, what is this? What is this institution? What is this organization? What is this behavior? But I learned from Rick that that's not where the question ends. And many of you in the room who know Rick well will know that the real question is, what is this an opportunity for? And that is the question I learned from Rick. And I particularly chose this format on the slide because it's one that allowed me to fade Rick out and put the student in the foreground because that's the way Rick always operated. Now, as you heard from Rick, this is one of the questions that became, I can't even look at him, I'm gonna start crying. <laughs> This is one of the reasons OS existed in the first place, that Rick asked this question, what is this an opportunity for? Uh, so as I joined OS in 2005, I saw that um, this question was informing every aspect of OS's culture uh, from uh, the way events were put on. Oh, it's still, <laughs> it's still doing that. Uh, to the way faculty were hired, to the way classes were run. And Rick's spirit of creativity and patience and commitment to students, it imbued every aspect of work studies by the time I arrived in 2005. And that was partly because of Rick and his devotion to the program, but also because of all the wonderful, generous people he brought in, he's named many of them, um, to bring their time and insight and support to the program. So what, what was what is OS an opportunity for? Well, when I got there, I had the great privilege of being part of these opportunities. Um, one way was through, uh, with the support of OS and the BLI, um, building bridges to local organizations. Um, this man needs no introduction. He's wearing the same thing he always wears, um, but I will mention his name in case some of you haven't run into him yet, um, Ari Weinzweig. Of uh, Zingerman, and this is Ari sitting meeting with uh, a group of. Um, I think it was in 2014, my corporate social responsibility class, um, and enjoying Roadhouse food and listening to Ari talk about anarchism, <laughs> bacon, and um, how to build a world famous business that's rooted in the local community. This is one of the kinds of, of bridges that OS built to local organizations so that students could learn from leaders about their own internal challenges and how they tried to serve their communities. Uh, another kind of uh, opportunity that was uh, supported by OS and the BLI was um, taking students to larger cities where the problems are even bigger and hopefully the solutions are bigger. Uh, and I had the pleasure, it was really the highlight of my teaching career so far, of taking uh, students for, for several years in a row, there's some in this room I'm delighted to see, and I'm sure some online, um, teaching a research seminar where we got to go to some larger cities and meet with uh, government leaders and leaders of scientific and cultural institutions to try to learn about um, how things were done in very different contexts from Ann Arbor. Um, so this is, uh, <laughs> This is a group from 2008, uh, from one of my classes, in the, at the New York Botanical Garden, clearly extremely excited to be there. Um, and 
every one of these semesters had an overarching research question, and I don't have time to, uh, to go into all the research questions that each class I'm gonna talk about uh, was pursuing, but uh, this class, we, we went to the New York Botanical Garden and number, another of, a number of other institutions. Um, the next uh, year, this is part of uh, the same uh, general kind of research class at the New York Botanical Garden again, and you can see that these trips had a lot of fun and a certain amount of glamour um, involved compared to classroom time, at least. Certainly when we were doing class in Denison in the old days, um, concrete walls and so on. And the students brought so much joy and energy and high spirits to these classes, but they were also very serious. We met with leaders and had um, kind of endless media. I mean, we were racing around these cities, meeting with people, doing tours, doing informational sessions, and then listening to me sort of debrief and ask them questions all along the way. Um, this is uh, the kind of thing we did that you don't think of a botanical garden when you see those pictures, but this is at the New York Botanical Garden. This is the Pfizer uh, Research Lab over here um, where we toured and saw biologists um, working to try to isolate new medicines from plant samples collected from all over the world. And this guy is, um, the facilities manager at the New York Botanical Garden, and I did not get him to paint the boiler maize and blue before we got there, but of course the students definitely noticed and liked that. But this is in the basement of the New York Botanical Garden where he tried to explain how hard it is to heat a, an acre of land covered by a glass house from 1901, single paned, to heat that through a New York City winter to protect tropical plants while you are also, as facilities manager, trying to be a leader in the city's climate change initiative. Um, talk about complex organizational um, missions. And we, we met with people like this who gave so generously of their time and insight. And we also had some adventures. Um, unfortunately, uh, our class trip to Chicago was, it had to happen in the winter for various reasons that had to do with you know, where we were in the series of, of visits and research. And uh, so we ended up in Chicago um, on a weekend that was, um, it was so cold, the wind chill was below zero, and it was so cold that Chicago was saying, the, the city was saying, stay indoors, Chicago. So you know, it was just, it was miserable. It was scary cold. Um, the students still had a, blast somehow, and you can see this picture, you think it's me trying to stay warm at the Chicago Botanic Garden, but in fact, it's uh, the students cracking me up so hard that I couldn't lecture to them. Um, and this is in minus wind zero wind chill. So we had some great times, but these trips, as fun as they were, there was a, a sense of shared privilege, the conviction that we were so lucky to get to do this hands-on organizational learning. And I remember Dave Barger meeting with one of these groups and, and saying, so we quoted you ever since, Dave. Um, so you really geeking out on organizational studies. <laughs> <laughs> so we would always say, we're geeking out. And um, so we did. And the students were so engaged, not just on these trips, but also in the classroom that, um, well, this is the most vivid example of, of this engagement. The fire alarm went off during class in Denison, and the seminar, I think it was something like two and a half or three hours long, and we were nearly done. And the fire alarm went off, and I said, okay, okay, you know, we've been talking for hours. You can go on your way. And they would not have it. They marched me outside, <laughs> out there, to uh, find a place to sit, and they continued class. And I was, I was made to stay with them. <laughs> um, very serious <laughs> students, uh, but also so much fun. And that was the same group that um, I managed to get to work on 18th century history, um, historical archives, historical figures, um, as we were studying uh, the impact of founders on their organizations. Uh, and uh, Rebecca Sundy, who's in one of these, in, in the picture here at the New York Historical Society, ended up becoming my research assistant on uh, American Eden, and the book is dedicated in part to her and then to my parents, of course. Um, but the most ambitious trip that we went on in, in this, my period in organizational studies was um, in my course on comparative international nonprofits. And here I have to thank Melissa, who worked so 
hard to organize this trip. I mean, for months ahead of time. And then with my totally equal co-leader of the students, possibly senior to me when we got overseas, um, so engaged and, and so brilliant about it all, and I couldn't have done it without you, obviously, so thank you, Melissa. And our destination, we left Detroit, and we, this is our first sight of the Straits of Gibraltar from the airplane, Africa and Europe beneath us, and we're, our destination was Morocco, where we were studying Moroccan nonprofits, volunteering for a week, and meeting uh, local leaders, and uh, learning about this beautiful country and its culture and its organizations to try to understand how uh, a country's history, its political history, its cultural history, shapes uh, a nonprofit sector so differently there from, from in our own country. So these are some of the ways that, that org studies have created opportunities uh, for students over the, the years that I was there. And I'm so grateful to have been able to participate in some of these some of these projects. Um, but OS is itself an organization, of course. Ever since, um, since graduate school, my, my area of interest in organizations has been founders and their aftermath. And it's usually aftermath. And one of the most moving things I've ever witnessed in my life and instructive happened in slow motion in org studies over several years when a founder leaves an organization, often that process is disruptive, uh, chaotic, and even damaging. And that's because of denial or carelessness um, or egotism. And what I watched in, in org studies over those couple of years was when Rick decided he was going to leave, to step down from, from the leader leadership role, when he knew when that was coming, he began to coach us towards that day with all the care and thought that he had put into his early years founding the program and establishing its, its daily life. I don't think that happens all that often, and it was absolutely marvelous to see and be a part of, and I will never, ever forget it. It was an event in my life that took two years to happen, and it was amazing to witness. Um, so we were so lucky in OS to have Jason willing, ready to step up and lead OS, which he did with incredible talent and grace. And then to have Mark agree to join the program and, and lead it with your steady leadership and your experience as a leader in sociology. And it's, there's not a lot I would fly out of New York for voluntarily at the moment. <laughs> I really love it there. But I could not not be here. And I, I want to wish OS a happy 20th anniversary and congratulate everyone who had a part in bringing the program to this day and to say thank you for the chance to be part of it both then and now. Thank you. But I do have notes. So this is a joy. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about why it's such a joy in a second. But I want to emphasize two things that you heard that better than anything I could put on paper, I think capture the spirit of the program. And then I want to spend some time because, you know, I'm an academic and my kids joke that if you wake me out of a sound sleep, I'll give a verbal term paper. <laughs> right? I want to spend some time contextualizing this thing and then give you just a little bit of an impressionistic sense of what it meant to someone like me to grow up professionally in this program. So what are the two things you should have heard? I love it. This is a program 
of curricular desperados who geek out. <laughs> Take a minute and enjoy both sides of that coin. Geeky desperado. <laughs> desperado geek. These things don't usually fit together. And what's interesting about it is how absolutely apt that pair of comparisons is and how much you can understand and unpack about OS from those two terms. And so if you take nothing else away, right, the legacy of geeky desperados right, and the next 20 years of that spirit is I think something that is absolutely unique about the Organizational Studies Program and that frankly could only have happened here. So this is a story about people. It's a story about organizations. It's also a story about an institution, the University of Michigan, right, which is by virtue of being an institution more than simply the sum of the technical requirements of getting education and research done. Right? It's an ethos. It's a way of going about life as an academic right? and work that situates and makes possible the geeky desperados. And so let's talk a little bit about that. I joined OS in 2002 and I had other choices about places I could have gone. Um, this was distinguished by virtue of the fact that it was a joint appointment in sociology and in this new thing, organizational studies, that at the time nobody really could understand. I mean, one of the first things I learned from Rick was the absolute power of a great flyer, right? So I recently founded a new organization and the first two things you ever want to do are make a flyer and set up a website because then you're real. Right, you can <laughs> hand that flyer to people, and no matter what else happens. So I joined organizational studies, and at the time, um, my advisors told me, basically, well, it's a risk, but if you go do this, right, this other place you could go, you'll be a good sociologist. If you take this risk, you have a shot at becoming a good social scientist. That's another piece of the geeky desperado. Right? One of the things you're going to hear from me and what you've heard from others is the ways in which the organizational studies program and the people in it rendered boundaries that are traditional in academic programs much more porous than usual. Some of that was frankly out of desperation because classes have got to get taught. You may not expect that 200 person bolus of student applications, but somebody's got to read them, right? Um, but it's really important to understand that this happened in a context where for a little while, normal ways of doing business were loosened in a fashion that allowed us, and it really was an us, to collectively create something that hadn't happened before. Now, why was that a special thing? Well, in a couple of ways, OS bucked important trends. And I'll come back to the boundaries in a second, but you have to understand what makes the desperado part of this. At the time when I joined OS, US higher education at an undergraduate level was at the beginning of a steep transition away from the liberal arts. Since 2002, in universities like the University of Michigan, bachelor's degrees in business have grown by 60%. Bachelor's degrees in social sciences have also grown, but by 26%. In the liberal arts, generally, the growth rate is 15%. When you take this and you normalize it by the number of students, 
right? Things are looking bad in some ways for the liberal arts and social sciences. OS entered the institution, right, the intellectual space of undergraduate life at a time when you looked at where everything was going and someone said, I should note that I didn't make a slide, but I too have what's this an opportunity for written in my notes. <laughs> and someone said, eh, everything's going this other direction. Of course we need a liberal arts alternative. And that had more implications. Part of the shift toward a business style of education in this space was a growth in focus on markets as coordination mechanisms, on profits and productive efficiency as the goal of corporation, of the organization, and of corporations and firms as the dominant form of organization that we should study. And organizational studies entered this space by hiring somebody who studies universities and somebody who was working on a book on why the Paris Opera survived the French <laughs> Revolution. Right. And soon thereafter, we had the fundamental social psychology of competition, and for a while, we had 11th century evolution of trading networks in the Indian Ocean. <laughs> These are topics only geeks could love. <laughs> but the fact that these topics and these people drew hundreds over the years of those geeky desperados spoke to something really important about the feel of the place and about the intellectual tenor of the organization. The other thing, back to the boundaries. You've heard some important stuff here. Let me tell you, I study universities for a living. Universities are not nimble. In other departments I've been part of, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got for sitting in a real faculty meeting, which honestly I'm not sure I ever experienced in organizational studies relative to some others that I've sat in was never offer a solution. Right? If two senior people are fighting about something and it seems obvious to you what should be done to solve the problem, shut up. <laughs> they are not fighting about the problem. You have no idea what they're fighting about. In 1986, one of them probably stole the other one's parking space. <laughs> right? And that's still a live feature of the discussion. Organizational studies wasn't like that. Right? I can't tell you how badly it spoiled me as an academic right, to not have a grumpy senior faculty, <laughs> right? to not have 15 or 20 years of this is the way we've taught this syllabus. This is what a core class is. When I took the job, Rick told me, we need a core class in macro organizations. I said, what do you want in it? He said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I spent my first summer terrified in the library, back when people still went to the library. Right. So the boundaries that get drawn around who participates and who had a say weren't the same. Right? The faculty and the staff and the students sat down together. The boundaries between who was in and who was out of the department didn't quite hold. Right? Folks who had no appointment in organizational studies, who weren't getting paid for it, threw their shoulders against the wheel. I see one here, Jerry, right, who I know has probably written like every single evaluation of me <laughs> that has ever been made by the University of Michigan. This Despite the fact, <laughs> I'm still here, so despite the fact that we have never, ever occupied the same department formally at the University of Michigan. Okay. This emerged from student interests. That's typically not the way it works. In fact, it's so not the way it works that it terrified a dean. 
Now, I'm kind of in favor of things that terrify Dean. Um, part of that's the history of working with Rick. So the other side of Rick <laughs> here, curricular desperados, met a friend in Rick. One thing I remember, it's not quite opportunities, but many years ago, our dean decided that the university wasn't going to pay for lunches at meetings anymore. Or if it did, the lunch had to be at a meeting that lasted a certain amount of time and had a set agenda. When faced with the question, what is the agenda that we need in order to get lunch, Rick <laughs> scrawled on a sheet of paper my still favorite agenda. Old business, new business, <laughs> matters arising. <laughs> now, I tell that as a joke, but it also speaks to the ways in which the program evolved and grew. It was always a case of trying to figure out how to identify and respond to the existing business how to turn that into opportunity, the new business, and how to do both of those things while remaining flexible and open enough to recognize that sometimes the most important matters are the ones that are arising right now. And I think you heard from our distinguished alumni, alumnus, right? some of that. And it's what I'd want to leave you with, a feature of a curricular desperado in this sense. And some of what I believe is absolutely the distinguishing educational feature of organizational studies is precisely the ability to keep your eyes open for the matters arising. To be dropped into an organization, a city, a market, a social movement, any one of the many different forms of social organization that we study and learn about, and on the fly, with others, make sense of it, identify where it's been, where it's going, and where it could go. And that's it. That's the key. And that's the thing that I think I learned in organizational studies, which has made me a terror to every dean <laughs> that I've had the joy of working with. It's also the thing that I hope you all recognize you've learned. I want to say one other thing. Oh, God. The last boundary that I mentioned, it's important to note, was apparent in Victoria's talk and is going to be apparent in the person who follows me in this talk, which is the boundary between the university and the program and the world it sits in. A boundary that was traversed all the time by faculty and staff taking students out, by alumni bringing wisdom and information in, by opportunities to sit down together and figure out not just what could arise here in these walls, but what was arising out in the world that we had the opportunity to try to figure out and address. Thank you. I can't tell you how much fun this is. Cheers, Dave. Sounds good. I think uh, sound is good here, Dave. Still need the, uh, still need the lavalier mic, correct? Okay. Very good. Uh, Dave Barger, really nice to be here. Thank you. I, uh, I, I, I love being the caboose in the conversation here. Uh, Mark, thank you for the invite, rescheduled invite as well to a 20 year celebration. Uh, of OS, and as I think about uh, the speakers that you uh, had today, uh, of course, starting with Sherry and uh, Dr. Price, 
right? Victoria, Jason, and so many friends in the room. It's, it's really just a pleasure here to uh, offer a few thoughts here uh, uh, to close, I think, this part of the program. First of all, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting because um, Brian Ar Arbeiter with Advancement, about 20 years ago when I was uh, cold called by um, Tom Baird, and Brian, Tom cold called me, he was an airline guy, and wanted to know, I was an airline guy. He was at Michigan at that point in time, but if I wanted to participate somehow in something at the University of Michigan from, was it fundraising, was it uh, uh, philanthropy, was it development, was it advancement? You have so many different titles that are part of this, this part of the organization well, sure, Tom, you're an airline guy. He was at People Express. I was then at uh, JetBlue, and uh, more than happy to. And, and I think, you know, this first thought that I want to share with you is, uh, especially with the, the students uh, over the 20 years, or if you're here today, of course, the staff, but I, I found most of the University of Michigan after leaving the University, University of Michigan. And because I was out, I mean, I was in the aviation career. I was also in New York at that point in time. And little did I know, and I, you know, this is like 20 plus years afterwards when I got that cold call about participating from the standpoint of supporting Michigan. And uh, whatever that might be, the time, talent, treasure, you hear these different terms. Uh, but Brian, I think what I want to share with you that maybe you can share with Tom is, let me see. Um, Terrifying deans, never offer a solution. Uh, macroeconomics, I, I don't know. I mean, whatever you want to put into it. No appointments. Uh, the agenda, I love this one. Old business, new business, matters arising. I, I absolutely love that. Who would fund something like that when you put, <laughs> when you put all that together? And little did I know, I was also at the same time, uh, 20 plus years ago, JetBlue was just being hatched. And listen, who's going to think that a brand like that has staying power in, in, in the airline space? And, and so I love pushing boundaries. I love risk. I love founders um, and working within founders. I was not the founder, part of the founding team. Such interesting dynamics. But it's amazing because uh, when you think about the opportunity to say, hey, listen, yes, uh, that brings me back to Rick because Rick, meeting you early on, it was like, yeah, something special here. Meeting Mary as well, something special here. Victoria, Jason, the list goes on in the early days, of course, the staff. And so my, my first thought is supporting the university. I found the bulk of my time and excitement with the university after leaving the university because of that cold call. I now live in Ann Arbor, I'm right in Carytown. I came back here after traveling around the world in the airline space. And so I do think if you're on campus today or if you've been part of the 20 years, think about how you can support something really special, something so differentiated as the University of Michigan. The second thought I just wanted to share is um, I was the second uh, CEO of the airline, and I had a chair who taught governance for a long time at Stanford and the GSB. And Joel Peterson, who also uh, successful in the business world, the finance world, and he says, you know, this is a blueprint. And somebody's got to have the vision. And then, well, you had that for 10 years, and you operationalized it. Rick, and then you, the team has to come together. Somebody's got that next set of the blueprint, Jason, in terms of how you shape it, and you know, you're know you operationalizing it, the building's coming out of the ground, and by the way, you're gonna go do something different. And, and, and Mark, as you then take that blueprint, you then take it for you know a long period of time, 10 years, and somebody will be after you as well. And, and high-performing organizations, they, they, they love that DNA of the blueprint. And the next person is going to take that baton and make something even better. And to think that this little program, the Desperados, I loved it. I can't get in the Beyonce gossip into my comments, but uh, the, the Desperados, the geeks, it's a blueprint comes to my mind as a second thought. And, and I'll close with this. It's um, org design, org effectiveness 
That's what caught it for me. Because you can have the boxes on the org chart, but how effective is the organization? And, and that's, that was the hook for me because it's a, at the time it was the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, it's the Air Transport Association, International Air Transport Association, Department of Transportation, all these different organizations and how can I help be effective, let alone at my own organization? And so I think of org design and org effectiveness, and, and it, was, it was so helpful to me to operationalize my leadership or my management style as a result of touching just a little bit of Rick, Jason, Mark, Victoria, others over the course of the last 20 years. And nothing more special than, Rick, you would talk about, uh, I love a leader who can be at the podium when it's necessary, but can you also lead from the back of the room? Can that next person, you know, you're, you're, you're filling the boxes. Step to the back of the room. Let them, you know, listen, give them the success, right? Don't delegate blame. You take blame as the leader in the back of the room. Uh, but let them take the podium from the standpoint of success. And, and so I think of, uh, again, org design, org effect effectiveness. And it's just so helpful, just even over the last two years, two and a half years. How do you operationalize that? And I'll give the podium back to, uh, to Mark and Chelsea, but it's, hey, Rick, do you have a little time for a cadence to talk with Kim Day running Denver International Airport? Loved it. Female leader leading the what was and is right now the largest airport in the United States because the travel changed because of international gateways changing. Kim has since retired, great leader. Oh, by the way, on this, uh, Rick, we're also gonna have Willie Walsh, who, who's running IATA over in Geneva, Switzerland, the International Air Transport Association. And let's bring in Nick Calio with the Air Transport Association. We were doing this during COVID from the standpoint of, listen, do people feel like they can travel safely? Do people feel like they can go to work and say, hey, listen, to my family, I'll be home at night without the risk of the virus. This is just over the last couple of years. So how do you operationalize the people that you meet over time? I'll tell you, it's a, I think about finding Michigan after I left Michigan. I think of blueprint and I think about org design, org effectiveness and friendships, just so important. So thank you so very much for the opportunity to share some thoughts with how important org studies has been to me and uh, just the support that I have found here in Ann Arbor by really being stretched, the boundaries, taking a little risk with some really great people. Thank you so much. Is this an amazing program or what? What could have been more incredible than the five talks we just heard. And I can't believe it's 1.30. It feels like it's been 10 minutes. But so I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Sherry, if she's still on. <laughs> um, and I know we're all excited about the reception. But before we move to that, there is one additional order of business. I have an important announcement to make. I would mentioned the. Barger Family Professorship that Dave generously endowed uh, and that has been held by all of the directors of the program. Um, well, Dave has one-upped himself. It wasn't enough to just endow the professorship, but now he has recommended that we rename the professorship, and in fact, it has just been approved by the regents of the University of Michigan that the Barger Family Professorship in Organizational Studies will heretofore be known as the Richard H. Price Professorship in Organizational Studies. I can't tell you. <laughs> not, not, only, not only is this an incredibly generous act by Dave, but I can't tell you how thrilled I am um, that it was named for Rick. I, I mean, I can't begin to say what Rick has meant to me. You, you all heard what he's meant to everybody else here. Um, so thank you, Dave. Thank you, Rick. And um, 
I think we have a little something for you, Rick. So I'll let Dave do the honors. Mark, thank you so much. It's a, uh, as I present this to uh, uh, Professor Price, Rick, dear friend, uh, colleague, and just, I mean, just so influential over the years in my life. Brian, I got to tell you, universities do move fast, right? Sometimes they're incredibly slow, Jays. Uh, but with the regions uh, approving this last Thursday, and your notice to us that it came across the bow on uh, Friday, and it was, there's a process that's tied into this, the governance, you should feel good about this. But I, I'm just delighted to present this to uh, Dr. Price. And uh, Rick, congratulations. Onward and upward to you, Mary, the family. Can't tell you how many lives you've touched. Rick Price. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Turn your mic on, turn your mic on. I just want you to know what I said before is so important to me. I'm now with my family, the people I've cared about so much and have given so much to all of us. And I'm honored and I love every one of you guys. Thank you. surprise special presentation. So you all have heard a ton about the importance of founders, but I want to follow up on something Dave said. Because in fact, uh, one of the things that I learned from him that was really important to me when I first stepped into Rick's shoes, uh, which was terrifying, <laughs> you know, he told me, something really important about being the second person in the chair. The one who takes the blueprint and turns it into the permanent organization, who makes sure that it keeps that spirit. I held on to it for a couple of years and kept it running. But we need to take a minute and say thank you to Mark who is the longest serving director in the history of organizational studies at 10 years. I thought Rick was 10 years. Wasn't I, Rick 10 years? I thought he was not. <laughs> but Whatever. tied for the <laughs> longest <laughs> running director. Right. I can't tell you how difficult, challenging, and I hope fulfilling the process of taking a vision, a blueprint, adding what's yours, bringing in new things, cementing the organization is. And so we won't have an opportunity right away because Mark's still in the chair for a few more months. But while we had the celebration, we'd be remiss if we didn't also say, Mark, congratulations, <laughs> thank you. Thank the you, program Jason. would not be what it is without you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say a couple of things. Um, you know, first of all, Rick, uh, I think Jason and I both felt this terror of how do you follow the charismatic leader, the person who put this thing together. And Rick was so overly modest in his earlier description of how he convinced the dean to fund this program. It was, let's just say the resistance he faced was much more severe than he let on. It was basically no, 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 no. And Rick pushing and pushing and pushing and finally convincing the dean to say yes. And this is what we have now to show for it. And then Jason, um, I can't say enough about Jason as, as a colleague. I'm, I'm so thrilled. You know, 
he mentioned he had other opportunities. Let's see, Yale, Columbia, Cornell, Northwestern. He had offers from all of those schools, and he turned them all down and came here. Um, and then, not only did he serve as interim, he, he took on an extra year because I had a sabbatical, and I really wanted that sabbatical, and Jason stayed on for an extra year. And he wasn't even a full professor at the time, did a phenomenal job. By the time I came into this job, it was like those moving escalators at the airport, you know? You, all I did was step on and, you know, with Melissa and, and, and Kathy and, and Chelsea and uh, everyone else, who Tiffany when she was here, who just makes this program go. All, it, it's, I mean, from my perspective, this was the easiest job in the world. Um, and it was because of the fantastic people who came before me in this role the incredible staff we have, and of course, our great faculty and our great students. So thank you all, and, and this program is going to live forever and, and be the greatest of its kind forever. So thank you all, and let's, let's, uh, let's party.